all the land that the people in the king's command should bow down to the dusty ground when they heard the trumpet sound. But the children of God refused to kneel. They defied the king with a fiery zeal. They were thrown in the flame that day. But you could hear those children say, God is able. God is able to deliver from the fire. He will rescue those who serve him when the flames are burning higher. Now don't you know that some things never change and the fiery trials are still the same. The children of God must face the test but we stand above the rest. So take courage, friend, and walk on through. God's going to face the fire with you. You can stand with the saints and say, My God will provide a way. God is able. God is able to deliver from the fire. He will rescue those who serve him when the flames are burning higher and higher and higher. God is able, God is able to deliver from the fire. He will rescue those who serve him when the flames are burning higher. This week that the flames have been burning higher and higher and higher in this report and that report. But you know what? God is more than able. Yes, he is. Amen. Praise his name.
We'll do another one before Alan comes around. Indeed, it was an angel that said unto you, is born this day in the city of David. Uh, what is he? I've been through the lineage of that name in the Old Testament first. Jehoshua, shortened to Joshua, and, and then in the New Testament, Jesus. It means our God saves. The most glorious fact you could enter into your consciousness is there is a Savior. Think about it for a minute.
Hey, this uh, this uh, redhead was enjoying a vacation down in the bayous in Louisiana, and so she wanted uh, she wanted a pair of uh, alligator shoes. So she went, she kept going from store to store to store to store, tried to find her a pair of reasonable price alligator shoes, and they had a no haggle pricing. You could not haggle on prices. So last store she went into, she finally went to. Storekeeper, and she said, well, I'm done with this. I'm out of here. I'm going to go get my own alligator and uh, make my own shoes. And he said, Well, you go right ahead, man. Go ahead. Do whatever you feel like you need to do. So she storms out. <laughs> she storms out, and uh, she, she starts heading to the swamp. Shopkeeper watches her. She travels off down the road. Well, that evening, he's driving home. time this evening is a nine foot gator comes into the water and starts swimming to it. Next thing you know, it's got a gun. Boom, boom. There's a gator. Go over there and grab the hold of it and drags it to the shore of that river. And so the, the, the storekeeper, he says, I got to see this. So he goes over there. She gets and she was kind of dragging and had to turn all kinds of stuff so she could not very well. It's a joy to be in God's house. Amen. 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 You pray for uh, uh, all the stuff going on in the back. Uh, you know, we want to we want to touch people this week. That's what it's all about, right? It's it's not just uh, uh, us growing. If, if you're here tonight and you're lost, you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Can I tell you, this altar is always open. You have an open invitation to come to know Jesus anytime you desire to come to know Him tonight. He's, uh, the, the, the privilege is here because I, I guarantee you at any time in this service, if he speaks to you and calls you to him, he's standing here with open arms waiting for you to come to him. So the opportunity is there. But can I tell you, it's also for us Christians so that we will move closer to him. Because <clears throat> there is a, uh, what, what I want each and every one of us to understand tonight is the day. I got saved at seven years old. Mount Calvary Free Will Baptist Church in Marion, North Carolina. My dad was up preaching, and by the time he got done, I couldn't stand my old filthy sin. At seven years old, I couldn't stand it. I had to make my way to an altar. I standing up beside my mother just bawling because I could see that I was lost and undone without Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. And the only step that I remember is the one outside of the pews, and I don't remember the rest of them. Next thing I know, I'm having hands all over my back praying for me up here on the altar, and people people just shouting because somebody came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Well, we ought to get excited. The pastor, eight people got saved at the Father's storehouse. We need to praise God. Amen. There's a new name written down in glory. Amen. Amen. Let's praise God. Get excited about things of God. Amen. That's what he wants us to do tonight. So, <clears throat> put your wife on, Alex. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Don't carry away. I didn't put mine on yesterday. I put it on real good. I just didn't put it on. So, <laughs> so we, we need to realize the day. Seven years old. I came to this altar. It's not just, see, you're not just fighting a war with the devil. You're fighting a war with this 
old nasty stuff that you read in the Bible, right? Right? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like my flesh gives me more of a bite than the devil does. Uh-huh. But boy, he knows how to use the flesh to aggravate you to death with it. But <clears throat> we need to understand war has been declared on him. But see, and what he does is he gets us so so mixed up in the mess that's going around in your life and we forget why we got saved this way. Brother Kevin, it's game on, folks. It's game on. So tonight, look with me. We're in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17. Hey, let's pray. Hey, can we remember, I want you to pray with me right now that, that this vacation Bible school it not only affects the youth of our church, but maybe one or two or three or four or however many God sees fit to say will be saved. And so let's pray that we as a church will draw closer to God and we'll get a greater desire to work for Him and be that that He wants us to be. Help me pray tonight. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. Lord, I praise your name. I thank you for a touch, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that even when this service started, Lord, I couldn't even hardly thought, but praise God for your touch. Lord, I pray tonight, God, that you would reach down, and I pray that you'd ever move in these services this week, Lord. I pray to God that you'd just be with our young people out there in the back. I pray that you'd ever just be with the teacher that helps helps Brother Mike, Lord, as he, he explains the way of salvation, Lord, as he explains... Lord, uh, we need to level up. As he explains, there is no game over with Jesus. Lord, I pray to God that you would just move in our hearts. Lord, help us to draw closer to you and be that that you would want us to be. And Lord, I pray to God that you would help us to be excited about our Christian life, Lord. Because we can't talk nobody into anything if we're not excited about it. Lord, we pray tonight that you would just move in our hearts and help us, Lord, that we would be the Christians that you want us to be. Help us to let our light so shine to this lost and dying world that people can see, Lord, that we love our Savior. Lord, that you're worth dying for. And I pray to God that you would just strengthen us tonight. Pray, Lord, that you would just have your will and your way in this service. Be with us, Lord, as we stand behind this sacred desk one more time this side of eternity, Lord. Please don't let me say anything, but, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and use me to God as that that you would have me to be that. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us tonight. Help us to grow in your word. Help us to be that that you want us to be. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'm in Mark, the first chapter tonight. Stand with me as we honor God's word. (coughs) Mark chapter 1, verse 16. says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers, right? They owned a business, catching fish. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Tonight, look with me. Game on. Catch all you can. Game on. Catch all you can. You may be seated. I heard this. uh, This is actually a parable. It was written by a minister in 1953. And it's a. To me, it shows the state of, uh, of where a lot of people are at. Listen, it says, on a dangerous uh, sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a a little life-saving station. The building was primitive, and there was just one boat. But members of the life-saving station were committed and kept a constant watch over the sea. When a ship went down, they unselfishly went out day or night to save the lost. Because so many lives were saved by that station, it became famous. Consequently, many, many people wanted to be associated with a station to give it 
uh, their time, talent, and money to support its important work. New boats were bought, new crews were recruited, a formal training session was offered as the membership in the life saving station grew. Some of the members became unhappy with the building that the, that the building was so primitive and that the equipment was so outdated. They wanted a better place to welcome the survivors pulled from the sea, so they replaced the, recur the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged and new decorated building. Now the, uh, the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. They met regularly, and when they did, it was apparent that they, <coughs> how they loved one another. They greeted each other, hugged each other, and shared with one another the events that had been going on in their lives. But fewer and fewer members now were interested in going to the sea for life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this for them. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast. The hired crews brought in into the life-saving station boatloads of cold, wet, dirty, sick, and half-drowned people. Some of them had black skin, some had yellow skin. Some could speak English well, and some could hardly speak at all. Some were first-class cabin passengers of the ship, and some were deckhands. The beautiful meeting place became a place of chaos. The plush carpets got dirty. Some of the exquisite furniture got scratched. So the property committee immediately had a shower built outside the house uh, where the victims of the shipwreck could be clean, cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a rift in the membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities for uh, they were unpleasant and a an hindrance to the normal fellowship of the members. Other members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they had uh, of those various kinds of people who would be shipwrecked, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And do you know what? And that's what they did. As years passed, a new station experienced the new changes the same changes that the, uh, the old had occurred. It evolved into a place of meeting regular for fellowship, for committee meetings, and for special training sessions about the mission, but few went out to the drowning people, and drowning people were no longer welcome at the, life -saving sta at the new life-saving station. So another life-saving station was founded further down the coast. History con continued to repeat itself, and if you visit the seacoast today, You'll find several adequate meeting places with ample parking and plush carpeting. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. You see, God's whole intent with the church was for the church to be a, a life saving station. Yes. Yes. But we were called, God called us to be life saving people. Can I ask you tonight, Terry, are we, are we life-saving? Are we pointing people in the right direction? See, I read this week, actually when I started studying this lesson, and it hit me. 95% of Christians have never led a soul to Jesus Christ. That's astounding, isn't it? 95%. Can I tell you what? We were called to do that, folks. Amen. Amen. We can say, I'm just bashful. But I tell you what, what Jesus saved you. Amen. He saved us for a purpose. Yes. He saved us so that we could live the life and show people that Jesus is worth living for. He's worth speaking up for. When nothing else is worth speaking up for, I tell you what, if in my most bashful state, if I ate at a restaurant and I enjoyed that, guess what I'm doing? I'm telling somebody, unless I don't want it to be overcrowded, I still want to be able to get my seat. But I'm still telling people about the nice place to eat, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If I stay at a nice place, guess what? Hey, if I know somebody that's going in that, that same area, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, hey, you need to go here. You need to stay there. Man, that's a nice place, brother. That's right. Bless the Lord. But do I do the same thing? See, I, I, I am convinced that I go through things in my life not so I can just 
keep my mouth shut that I've went through them. I, I have gone through those things in my life. I've told you about the addictions that I've gone through. I've told you about the troubles I've gone through. You know why I went through those things? So I can, so I can associate with somebody who's right. been through there and I can tell hey, there's hope for you because Jesus still loves you regardless of what you've been through. Regardless of all the trash that you've had in your life, Jesus still loves you. Oh, yes, he does. He died for you. When, when nobody else cared about you, when nobody else gave you a thought, Jesus loved you. And he died on the cross for you <laughs> to make you his child. So tonight, look with me, because I want us to see this is what he said. It's not natural for you to be a fisher of men. It is not natural. He said, I will make you to become I will make you to become All we have to do is follow him. And he will make us become fishers of men. Because, guess what? We should. I don't believe Jeremiah's testimony was just about preaching. I believe he said it's a fire in my bones. Yeah. Hey, no way I can hold it in. You know, hey. when fire, when a fire is let loose, you, you can't contain it. It's, it's going. It's going somewhere. It's coming out somewhere. That, that is exactly the way our Christian walk ought to be. It's coming out somewhere. Somebody's going to hear it somewhere. Hey, if I have to preach in my sleep, I'll preach in my sleep. I've done that before, too. So, make you to become fishers of men. See, this plan wasn't just thought up when Jesus showed up on the seashore. Look at this in, the, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. This is what Isaiah said. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. There's no other way to be saved. There is no other way to be saved. This plan was started from the foundation of the earth. It wasn't, it, Adam and Eve, it didn't surprise God. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew that, uh, that he was going to have to offer up his only begotten son for each and every one of us. He knew that when he created man. He knew that. But guess what? He created him anyway. So the plan was there from the beginning. Because God is the only way to offer that. He could have made us robots where we just would automatically nail down and worship Him. Yeah. But He chose to give us a free will to do what, what we want to do, whether it hurts us or not. Isn't that amazing? But He gave us that free will. But there's a price to pay for it, right? So <clears throat> he's saying, look unto me and be ye saved because I'm the only way that you can be saved, right? Amen. Look at Luke chapter 2. This is Jesus, what, two, two three days journey, and they, they couldn't find him. They couldn't find him. And, and so they go back and they get him, and this is Jesus' response. They found him in the temple teaching. All the smart alecks there in the temple, he was teaching them. And Jesus said, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. His father's business was I got to get into the word of God and I got to tell people how that I am come to make them free of their sins. You see, everybody look, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah is coming to set up a kingdom. But Jesus said, no, he said, first, we got to get you right spiritually before we put you in the kingdom. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. we got to get rid of them old sins because just like the children of Israel, where they came out in the wilderness, our pastor preached that a couple weeks ago, come out into the wilderness to get to know him. Uh -huh. He's not taking you to heaven if you don't know who he is right now. Uh -huh. If you don't know Jesus tonight, can I tell you, Jesus loves you uh -huh. and he wants you. He wants to know who you are. So he said, I've got to be about my father's business. That's you and me now. We need to be about because 
I read something this week. Man, I love this. Did you know that according to Roman law, when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, if you had a, a, a natural born child, that you could actually disown that child to where they never knew you, like you never knew them? However, if you adopted a child, if you adopted a child, you could never get rid of it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, I ain't going nowhere. I'm a child. He adopted me in. I'm his. He covered me because he born me into the family, and then he also adopted me, right? Praise the Lord. He covered both territories there. Under the Roman law, I'm, I'm his forever, never, never. Amen. You can't get rid of me. You're stuck. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's what we should desire for everybody around us. Everybody, do you realize there's people that you come in contact with today that you may never come in contact with you that will drop off in hell before you ever get a chance to see them again? And every person we meet is a soul. Regardless of what color the skin is, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of, of how far, uh, how much arguing and fussing you got going on in your life, that person is a soul. Amen. And we need to remember that. That person is a soul. And, and so Jesus said, I got to be about my father's business. Are you about the father's Amen. business? Amen. Or are we caring too much about our own business to worry about the father's business? I heard my brother say one time, I made it a lot better when I finally put my business in his hands. Let him take care of it. He does a lot better, better job taking care of my business than I do. And I found the same thing. Because Jesus t tells us, I've got to be in my father's business. And then in John 3, 16, we know this verse. For God so loved the world. God so, for God so loved you and me. Hey, don't forget that. God loves you. Regardless of all the mess you've got going on in your life, regardless of how much the devil tries to screw your memory up where you can't remember, Jesus loves you. Amen. God so loved you Amen. that he sent his only begotten Amen. son. Amen. The son that he loved, the son he adored, he gave him for you. Amen. Love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. Oh, yes. It's eternal life, folks. Amen. It's eternal life. It's amazing that we, we don't think about eternal life. We base our minds, can't comprehend. So what we do is we, we think everything in terms of this life. This life is the shortest life you'll ever live in. Anyway. <laughs> we ought to focus more on the main life. And that's the life to come. Amen. Because this life is so short compared to that life. But have everlasting life. And then, this is the, the uh, we love to quote this one, right? I love this thing being so down, down here where you get to it, right? Right. I can reach it better. I'm not tall like you. So, we like to quote this, but we forget this. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Hey, if anybody had a right to condemn you and me because of our sins, guess who it was? It was the son of God. But God didn't send him into the world to point a finger at you and tell you, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He didn't do that. He sent him into the world, this world, to save us, right? But that <clears throat> that the world through him might be saved. Amen. That was his whole purpose in coming. That's the Father's business, right? Arranging it so you and I could have a relationship back with the Father. That was the whole purpose of it. So look with me. First thing we he said, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of the Lord, God our Savior. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Who will have all men to be saved 
and to come into the knowledge of the truth. That's, that's what's acceptable, right? This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That's what God's desire is. I went to a church. I was 31 years old. And I was going through a bust up of a relationship. And a buddy I worked with, he said, why don't you come on to my church for a year? It was a different denomination. I went in there. I sat in their Sunday school class. They had a Sunday school class where you could learn their denomination. I had heard their preacher. Man, he fed me from the pulpit, and I enjoyed that. So I, I knew a couple of Sundays, so I went to that Sunday school class. And I sat there, and I heard a woman say, it took a long time for me to come to accept that it may not be meant for my children to be saved. I said, no, I'm out of here. Whosoever. Whosoever. Whosoever draws all through the book. Don't throw them out. I'm a whosoever. I'm a whosoever. The devil tried to tell you, trick you, and tell you that you're not worth being saved, but you are today because Jesus Christ died for your sins. And that's God's will that we come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's that he is Lord and Savior of all. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He put on flesh to become uh, the, the mediator between us and God. That our relationship could be mended. We could be put back together. And that's the reason the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. Because he opened that up for you and I just to be able to walk in and say, My Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Titus, I'm trying to hurry. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto who? All men. All men. All men. Praise, the Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That grace is not distributed out by color of skin. It's not distributed out by... Well, what's in your bank account, like some of the preachers want you to think about? It's not distributed about, well, I've been coming to this place all my life. No, it's available to all men regardless of who you are and where you've been and what you've done. Amen. It's available to you. Amen. Charity, don't forget, it's available to everybody. And that's exactly who God wants it to have. It's everybody. It's His will that all men be saved. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. The grace of God. We wouldn't stand a chance if it wasn't for the grace of God. Because that is what's, is what's brought about the salvation yes. to all men. The Lord is not slack. This is Peter. This is, this is the one who, and we're going to be talking about it later on this week, about, uh, about the denial. About how he felt. But later on, this is what he said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But it's long suffering. Somebody say praise the Lord right there. Amen. Amen. Excuse me, I had to swallow that cough drop or I'm going to be choking on it. <laughs> He's long suffering. Amen. Hey, that means he deals with you and me. That means he's not instantaneous on destroying you on the spot, right? He, he, he deals with us in a slow-like manner, which I wish I was more like. Amen? But uh, sometimes I, I get too hasty and I want to fly off the handle about something. But he is long-suffering. To me, that's even above patient, right? He's long. He deals with me in a long period of time. He doesn't act, act hastily. To us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his will, that we should all come to repentance. He wants everybody to come to know him. But the church world's forgotten that. We like to cherry pick, not, not so much cherry, because I think we open our arms up to pretty much anybody that comes in. But can I ask you, how much are you opening your arms when you go outside the doors? <laughs> we love it when they come in here to see us. And we'll open our arms, hug their necks, tell them Jesus loves you. But how much are we 
open their arms when we're out there. That's when we need to let that light shine. And that's what came to my mind a couple of weeks ago when I studied and started studying through this lesson. Are you doing what you're supposed to do, man? Are you witnessing like you're supposed to? Hey, when that door is opened up, are you shed, are you stepping on into it? Or are you just hesitating? Can I tell you, hesitation is the worst thing you can do. That Holy Spirit prompts you to step in there. You better step in there. Whatever one of the pastors say, Holy Spirit tells you to do something properly. Say like he does, but get in there and get it done. You need to jump in there and, and take care of business. Because he didn't open that door just for no reason. Uh, he right. I heard someone say he was on a train and a fellow come in and sat down beside of him. And he said, The long trip they were on. The fellow looked at him and said, What do you do for a living? And he says, A preacher. He said, I, I, I'm a preacher. He goes, Oh, okay. Finally, about five, ten minutes ago, I looked at him and said, Can I well since you're a preacher and we got a long time to go? He said, Can I ask you? How should I feel about God? And the preacher said, His son. He said, I have all these different ways of witnessing to people, all of them mapped out in my head. Things I know that I should say. He said, But when you ask me that way, he said, it stunned me. It threw me off. And he said, so, he said, I guess start giving them the, the pan answers, you know, the, that we all have. Just, you know, oh, God said this, what we've done this, what we've done. He said, instead of following my heart, I just gave them the pan answer. And he said, when they got to where they was going, when the guy got to his stop, he said, he got up, walked to the door, and he said, you know, I stopped to do Thanks for trying. And that preacher said it broke his heart. Because, see, there for a second he hesitated. And when he hesitated, the devil jumped all over him. Because he'd take the words out of your mouth, he'd take the words out of your mind, and boom, it's gone. The Holy Spirit says, Go now, go now, go now. I'll give you the words. All you got to do is go now. I'll tell you what to say, I'll tell you what to do. Just go now. What we need to see is this. Next panel. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. See, that's my family. That's your family. That's my friends. That's your friends. See, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. Is that worth it? Is that worth it? Bless the Lord. Sherry, please. Let's be a life saving station. Amen. Let's be a, a station that draws people in. That we can we can tell them you can come here and find life and find it more abundantly. You won't find it out there in a pill bottle. You won't find it out there in a bottle of alcohol. You Amen. won't find it out there laid up in a motel somewhere with somebody else where you'll find it is here in God's house Amen. and with God's people. Amen. Because he's the only way. He is the only way to true life. Amen. Because, uh, see, this is, this is the reality of it. The devil, his greatest lie nowadays is telling people there is no devil and there is no hell. Uh -huh. That's right. But the Bible tells us there is a literally burning hell and there is a devil who's going to burn in it one of these days. But what I want you to see also is this, this next panel, and this is the last one. For the Son of Man is come. And notice, you see, he could have done exactly like he did with Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth, right? And boom, here comes Lazarus doing the bunny hop outside of that dream, right? Man, he could have done the same thing with lost people. He could have said, come to me. I pick a, a, a carrier all the time about she's got some kind of name that don't go. All she has to do is say, come to me, you know, and here he comes. But 
That's what Jesus could have done to the lost people when he was walking the face of the earth. He could have just lifted up his arms and said, come to me. And people would automatically come to him because he's the Savior of the world. But he chose not to work it out that way. Right. He chose to work it out to where it's our will to come to him. Uh -huh. He wants you to willingly follow so guilty. Hey. Hey. Because you know he's the only way to have life. And through him we can have life more abundantly. But notice what he had to do. <coughs> Instead of just speaking it out and letting it be done. He created the world, the world that way, right? He spoke it into existence. What did he have to do? He gave him a seed. See, even he sought after people to speak to him. He sought people to witness to him. He sought people to tell him about Jesus, about himself, about him being the Messiah. He went out and looked for people because the harvest was great. went out and sought people. He had to. He put himself to work in that field. And if Jesus did it, you and I have to do it. Would you help me? Seek and save that which was lost. Jamie, would you help me point more and more people to Jesus? Because he's so worthy to find. It's such a it's such an honor to lead somebody to know Jesus. Amen. It's such a privilege to introduce your Savior to a lost individual. Amen. And once you ever do it, you can't get over it. Right, you did. You'll, never, you'll never get over that passion and privilege. Amen. Would you stand and bow your head? <laughs> While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask you two questions. Do you want to win souls? Do you have a burden for souls? Right? That's the first thing that has to happen. But the first piece of information and question you need to answer is, are you saved? You'll never win a soul until you're sure you're saved. Until you know you're on that rock. Have you done what the Bible says do to be saved? Maybe you've been in church all your life. I don't know. Some of you do. Some of you I don't. Make sure about your calling and election tonight. You've got burdens for family members. I believe you. You want to show that desire, you just come forward. Preacher, I've got somebody on my heart, on my mind. If you don't, you need to get somebody in your heart and on your mind. You don't have to hold. Somebody you're not sure about. Or you have a certain timidness in your spirit, as Alan talked about. Don't want to cause trouble. Don't want to hurt feelings and you don't understand the urgency or you want the Holy Spirit to give you the words in the spirit of Christ to charge people to challenge people but not upset people that's not our goal God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved anybody want to raise their hand for prayer tonight I'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the messenger, Lord Jesus, and the earnest preparation. I thank you for your spirit. Lord, I felt his heart while he preached tonight. And I thank you for that most of all, Lord, that I feel your heart as well. I know the heart that you have. Lord, you know the hindrances to it. Our wife talked about, Lord Jesus, and the things that are happening and we've also seen the evidence of the devil but there's nothing formed against us that can stand Lord we pray for healing you have burdens for people Lord in that sense too I pray that you move you died for that you shed your blood for that Lord we can believe it we can trust in it you'll give us you said follow me and I'll make you you can take care of that Help us, Lord Jesus. Make this an army. We're praying for those youngsters out there, for the teens down at the Hodges. Lord, that you'd bless them and their teachers and their counselors and people that are working, whether it's crafts or food or whatever they're doing, please bless them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
decided, have you decided to follow Jesus? I spot of honor. Thank you for being here. Now, this is Wednesday night. May not look like Wednesday night in here, but I hope we can look for you back tomorrow night. We'll get blessed again. If you want to, uh, go back through there. You can see what some of the kids are doing, and there's some refreshments, some themed refreshments back there. There's some clever things there always are, so you go and see and check that out. God will bless you. Show your interest in Bible school this week, okay, and the interest in the Word of God. He'll bless you. All hearts satisfied. Brother Michael Cox, will you dismiss us in prayer? Pray for our sick folks. We'll see you tomorrow night.
I think. Oh, it's still on, but I bought. I think the uh, Knoxville Empire or something. Huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's still on. I heard your words and I felt your heart. Uh.